Hello, welcome to The Biblical Perspective, an in-depth expositional study in the Word of God. everyone and greetings in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome to another presentation of the Biblical Perspective Bible Study. My name is Kevin Dunnigan and joining me for our discussion is my lovely wife, partner in love, my wife, <laughs> Yvonne. You. Welcome Thank teacher you. Yvonne. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm glad that you're here but we're going to jump right into this study. It's going to be a dynamic time so uh, let's, let's have some fun here. The theme scripture today, which is uh, Romans 15.4, this verse indicates that we can receive encouragement from studying the holy scriptures of the Bible and then living our lives based on the information and instruction. Romans chapter 15, verse 4 reads as follows, For whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction, so that through perseverance and the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. Do you mind if I explain that word encouragement? Sure. Well, I was reading about this word encouragement. From the dictionary, the meaning is the action of giving someone support, confidence, and hope. And from the, the, the source, the heartening, the cheering, the cheering up, the lifting up, the inspiration, rallying, motivation, excitement, and stimulation. Now, let's look at why we need to stay encouraged. The certain warfare. Before salvation, believers were in the domain of spiritual darkness, which was controlled by, and which is controlled by Satan. And they were enemies of God. At the point of salvation, that means accepting Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, they were moved by the, from there to the kingdom of God and became enemies of Satan. So switch roles. The result is that Satan, who hates God and all righteousness, has ongoing warfare against everyone who is saved. And he and the army of demons, fallen angels, that he commands. And I just want to interject a little something. Because he cannot change our position or our standing with God, he tempts believers to sin and tries to prevent them from godly behavior. In Colossians 1, 12 through 14, it says, Give thanks to the Father who has qualified, that means enabled us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. For he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. And that means God has purchased our freedom and forgave our sins. Amen. I hope that this excites you as much as it does me. He made a way for us to understand this through the scriptures. Remember this term for our learning in Romans 15, 4. The encouraging scripture text, God Almighty, whom we serve, is stronger than Satan and able to not only keep us saved, but also able to keep us safe. The biblical writer, Jude, said that he can keep us from falling and deliver us faultless at the return of Christ. That truth and many other scriptures in the Bible gives us the encouragement we need to remain confident that we can win the spiritual battles we face. In 1 John 10, 28 and 29, it says, 
I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, ever. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father has given them to me, is greater than all. No one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. Amen. And I just have a comment there mm -hmm. where it said, we're, we're talking about this. So as believers, we need to stop giving Satan the power he doesn't deserve. Mm -hmm. He is not or has never been equal to our God. Amen. Well, let's delve into the presentation. Let us look now at a partial list of what the scriptures provide that gives us encouragement or gives encouragement to believers. First and foremost, primarily the promises of God. Believers are empowered and encouraged by the scriptures that inform us of what God has given to us that gives us the ability to live godly and resist sin. He has promised to never forsake us, to strengthen us when we are weak, and to give us the guidance we need. These are all promises, remember. The following passage informs us on this point, which is found in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 2 through 8. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. For his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who has called us, who has called us by his own glory and excellence. Though the, I'm sorry, through these he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world on account of lust. Now, for this very reason also, applying all diligence in your faith supply moral excellence, and in your moral excellence, knowledge, and in your knowledge, self-control, and in your self-control, perseverance, and in your perseverance, godliness, and in your godliness, brotherly kindness, and in your brotherly kindness, love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they do not make you useless nor unproductive in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> you know, something came to mind when I was reading this part. Mm -hmm. And I, I like to say it or take it like this, that we use, you know how we use supplements for our physical body. Right. Well, I was using these things as supplements for our spiritual body. I like that concept. So we take these and we let them grow. Like this would be more productive. We would be more productive and useful for God. They're numbered. This is numbered here. You've given all of these examples of what we're to do become, to become that useful and godly person for God. We just need to read the scriptures. Yes. Now, as I was reading this, I, I, I took my little shovel and did a little bit of digging. And what Peter indicated was that grace and peace, those two wondrous gifts, are ours in the knowledge of God and, our, and Jesus Christ our Lord. As we know God, we gain these essential foundations for salvation and living. Let me say that again. As we know God, we gain these essential foundations for salvation and for living. Yeah. However, not only grace and peace, but also all the things that pertain to life and godliness are ours through the knowledge of him. So in essence, mm -hmm. you have to spend time knowing and understanding God. Yeah. Knowing God is the key to all things that pertain to life and godliness. Man is willing to try almost anything except the knowledge of God. <laughs> he will trust in the schemes and plans of other men instead of the knowledge of God. He'll try to find courses to understand and know himself instead of the knowledge of God. Absolutely. So we need to come to the same place that the Apostle Paul did when he said, that I may know him. Mm -hmm. And that reference yes. point is in Philippians chapter 3, verse 10. Now that was just verse 2 and 4. Mm -hmm. If you break down 5 and 6, we are partakers of the divine nature. Now, when you look at the divine nature, the divine power, that's what created the universe. Yes. But once we are made spiritual sons and daughters, growth in the Christian life doesn't just happen to us. Mm -hmm. We're supposed to give all diligence to our walk with the Lord. Yes. That means 
focus and effort, putting that as a primary focus, bottom line. So when it says add to your faith in virtue, we begin our life with God with faith. But faith progresses into virtue. Mm -hmm. It progresses into knowledge. It progresses into self-control. It, can, it uh, progresses into perseverance, godliness, and brotherly kindness, and ultimately, as Peter wrote, love. Love being the capstone of all God's work in us. These dynamic qualities are not things that the Lord simply pours into you as we passively receive. Instead, we're called to give all diligence, all effort, all mm. focus yeah. to these things, working in partnership with God to add them. Finally, in verse 8, if we have these things and they abound in us, mm -hmm. it's evident to everyone that we're not barren or unfruitful in our knowledge of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Because whether it's through con conversation, participation, or observation, people will see the love that is talked about, the perseverance, the kindness, the self-control that's mm -hmm. talked about in our actions. And let me, mind, let me say this just for clarification purposes. The words barren and unfruitful characterize the lives of many Christians who lack these qualities because they lack their knowledge of God. Mm. In, in, by basically, it's saying they know him religiously, not relationship-wise. With that being said, I'll let you continue. <laughs> I love it. I love it. The power resists Satan. Through God, the Holy Spirit, who lives within us, believers have the power to resist Satan and demons and walk in righteousness, as God desires us to do. We cannot stop the temptations from coming. That is true. But we have the ability, that means God has given it to us to stand firm in our faith and say no to them. We know that we can do this because God told us to do it. And he would not give us a command that we could not carry out. It is encouraging to know that we can win against evil spirits. In James 4, 7, it says, Submit, therefore, to God. Be, but resist the devil, and he will flee from you. The oversight of God. We are also encouraged to read in the Holy Scriptures. I go back. Read in the Holy Scriptures that God will protect us from temptation, test, and trials. That he knows we cannot overcome them on our own and still glorify him in the process. Additionally, we are told that we, as we deal with issues that we face in our lives, he will assist us and help us to be successful. In 1 Corinthians 10, 13, it says, no temptation has overcome you except something common to man. And God is faithful. So he will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. With that temptation, we'll provide a way of escape also so that you may be able to endure it. And I said, ha, look at this. What the scriptures are saying here is that in your life, your lives are no different from anyone or any other thing that people have experienced. And God is faithful then. And he will always be faithful, even now. He will not allow temptation to be more than you can stand or go through. He will show you a way so that you can endure it because of, of he thinks, I'm sorry, because of that we can handle challenging moments. So there has always been times where people have gone through challenges and trials and tough things to get through. But God is always there. He'll find a way or make a way for us to get through it. Teach, teach, teach. <laughs> <laughs> okay. continuing, continuing on, um, the imminent battles. In light of certain spiritual warfare that each believer will face, we are to stand firm and to access the spiritual armor or gear that God has provided for us. After being told that we have spiritual enemies 
and that spiritual battles are inevitable, each piece of gear that we are to acquire and clothe ourselves with is listed. And this list can be found in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11 through 13, which says, Put on the full armor of God, so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For the struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of his, this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wick, wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God, God so that you will be able to resist on the evil day. And having done everything, stand mm. firm. Mm. Yes. Uh, as I, and I'm, I want to break this down, but when I was reading this, it reminded me of when I was a little kid, little, little kid. We used to have dirt rock fights. Mm. <laughs> now, the dirt, dirt rocks aren't, not, aren't like you know, hard rocks or stone. Yeah. They would just like, you know, break up. But as a kid, you're thinking, oh, if I get hit by the dirt rock, I'm going to have to go to the hospital. And I remember one time I got tired of losing. So I went in the house and I put on my mother's thick fur coat that she had, that she didn't know that I had it. <laughs> yeah, I got in trouble. <laughs> But I won the next two dirt fights because I could stand firm in the midst of those fiery darts, I mean those dirt, dirt rocks. So it kind of took me back down memory lane. Oh. <laughs> so as I continue, um, when you look at verse 12, the fact that our real battle is not against flesh and blood, mm -hmm. it's, against, it's forgotten by many Christians. You know, we, we put on all the efforts in, in a direction that has nothing mm -hmm. to do with the, the spiritual aspect of our, our, our problems, but we look at the physical, mm -hmm. the, the, the individuals or the circumstances that are being used by those forces. Paul's idea here is, is much the same as in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3 and 4, which says, for, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. Paul used a variety of, strong, uh, of terms to refer to our spiritual enemies. We should regard them as being on many different levels and of many different ranks, yet they all have one goal, mm. to knock the Christian down from their peace, place of standing. Mm. Yeah. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11 tells us that all of our warfare is combating the wiles of the devil. And at the end of the day, it's completely irrelevant if the particular opponent we face is a principality, it's a power, or a ruler of the darkness of this age. Collectively, they are all members of spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. They're all part of the spiritual army that is organized and established into ranks and is under the headship of Satan who comes up against us. Now, we can learn more about these principalities and powers from the passages in the New Testament. Romans chapter 8, verse 38 tells us that principalities cannot keep us from God's love. Therefore, there's a limit to their power. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 20 and 21 tells us that Jesus is enthroned in heaven far above all principalities and powers. Colossians chapter 1, verse 16 tells us that Jesus created principalities and powers. So if he created them, then mm -hmm. he's above them. Yes. And he is in us. <laughs> Therefore, Jesus is not the opposite of Satan or principalities. He's higher than that. Mm -hmm. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 10 and 11 tells us that the church makes known the wisdom of God to principalities and powers. And finally, in Corinthians chapter 15, verse 24, tells us principalities and powers have an end. One day their purpose will be fulfilled and God will no longer let them work. Therefore, God has a purpose allowing them to work. So if you're dealing with spiritual warfare, God has a purpose in that mm -hmm. for you and for his glory. The battle gear explained. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 14 through 17, the scriptures list each piece of the believer's armor. One, the belt of truth is living by God's truth. Mm -hmm. Number two, the breastplate of righteousness is holy living. Three, the shoes of peace is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Number four, the shield of faith is confidence in God. The number five, the helmet of salvation is knowing you belong to God. And lastly, number six, the sword of the spirit is the word of God. The prayer encouraged in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18, will aid us in keeping the armor on and hold it in place at all times, and especially those times when we need it. Yes. So God has given us 
a, the ability to stand, mm -hmm. and he's given us this armor to put on. Everything tell if we're reading the scriptures and understanding it, then it tells us everything that these pieces of warfare is for. So we have the ability to stand. So my hope and prayer is that we would learn so that we can mature. And so we're going to move on to maturity and deliverance from trials. Mm -hmm. We are encouraged by the biblical writer James to know that if we adopt the proper perspective, oh, come on, <laughs> perspective, proper perspective, as we go through the inevitable trials that we are going to face. So being a believer doesn't mean you get excused right. from trials. Right. We are in life and of this life. We can gain spiritual growth towards Christian maturity. Also, we are told by the psalmist that even in the deserted place, I'm sorry, in the deserted and dry places in life, we can find refreshment and that God will be there to give us ongoing strength. In James 1, 2 through 4, it says, Consider it all joy, my brothers and sisters, when you encounter various trials. So not only are we going to have a certain, a, a specific, but it's going to be various. We're going to go through many things in life. Knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance and let endurance have its perfect result so that you may be perfect and complete, lot, not lacking anything or lacking in nothing. Also, here it's telling us, that's just my comment, <laughs> us to let our faith grow. Let it grow. It's a process that we're going through. It must grow through some challenging tests. This is, we're talking about our faith. Do it for the Lord so that he can mature us. It's not for our harm, but for our good. Amen. In Psalms 84, 5 through 7, it says, Blessed is the person whose strength is in you, in whose heart are the roads to Zion. Mm. Passing through the valley of Baca, they make it a spring. The early rain also covers it with blessing. They go from strength to strength. Every one of them appears before God in Zion. And I love this scripture because I read it in another um, translation. But it talks about uh, what this strength is and who's going through it. And it was saying what blessed is the person Mm -hmm. who goes through this. What joy for those whose strength is from God. Mm -hmm. And it talked about the valley of Baca. It was saying this was a valley of weeping. Oh. It was called. And then it also says that the people who are going through this, they make their place a place of refreshing. So you're thinking about it. It's not, I, I don't, don't get lost in the fact that you're going through these trials. Know who's with you while you're going through these trials. And that God is strengthening you, strengthening you and making you stronger and stronger. So by the time that you get to the end of your faith or your Christian life, you are so attached to God that nothing else matters. So it's important that we get through the end of this process. And if I could put a tail on that, um, I liked in, when you first started, uh, in the first sentence it, of the writer, uh, whether it was through his knowledge of the power of the Holy Spirit as far as Pastor Fred, yeah. uh, he said, he used the term adopt. Mm, yes. And, you know, we come, we're confronted with situations and circumstances, all of us, you know, there's nothing new under the sun. But 
if you look at adoption, adoption isn't something that runs to you. Adoption is a process of you grasping, taking hold, and, and accepting. So when you're confronted with a situation, as Paul has, has written, you know, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, mm -hmm. which includes our own feelings, which yes. includes our own uh, uh, negative heart, per se, that, that area where the Holy Spirit hasn't taken over, we haven't relinquished, relinquished yes. to the Holy Spirit. So it, the adoption takes a process. So you're confronted with a situation, but you're given an option that Paul and the scriptures and God has so that you take hold of it and hold it near and dear to your heart. You yeah. say, I'm going to do this in spite of my, what my eyes see as my circumstance. Mm -hmm. I'm going to listen to God's word in spite of what is going on around me that I hear. Mm -hmm. I'm going to take hold of this in spite of how my feelings want to react to this. Yeah. And you adopt this. Now this becomes yours. Yes. Now if this becomes yours, you have a responsibility to take care of it. You have a responsibility to nourish it. You have a responsibility to grow it within your heart and within your mind. Going back to that proper perspective. Mm -hmm. It's a perspective that is not natural. It's a perspective that we have to change. Like you said, take hold to it. It's in there and it talks about that change that we need to make in order for this to take effect. And if it's not natural, then it's supernatural. supernatural. Mm -hmm. Come on. <laughs> In summation, we will conclude our discussion with the words of the writer Jude. He wrote in, first, in the first chapter, uh, verse 24 and 25. Now to him who is able to protect you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, mm -hmm. dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever ever after. Amen. Amen. It's very encouraging for believers to, to have the assurance of the providential care of God. And that's just not just having it, but living it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's one thing to uh, own a suit, yes. but if you keep it in the closet, what good is it? Yeah. But you have to put on that suit. You have to put on that adoption. You have to put on that armor. You have to put on the principles of, of Scripture and wear it proudly, not for yourself, but to the glory of God. Amen. Do you have any closing remarks? My closing remarks are we are in good hands with our God. So we listen to what the Word is saying. Get the encouragement from the Scriptures that you need and grow this Christian life and glorify our God. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> Once again, thank you for uh, allowing us to share this time with you. We hope you that we hope that it's been able to bless you. Uh, I know it's been a blessing here, you know, being able to share. And until next time, we see you at the Biblical Perspective. Be blessed. <laughs>